welcome back to That Grief Relief Podcast. I'm Katie Overy. Don't know what episode number this is. I should remember that. It's either 14 or 15. Anyway, we're back on Zoom because this episode, I'm actually really, really honoured to be joined um, from someone stateside. Um, it's actually the lovely, lovely lady behind the Instagram account that I recommended way back in episode two of that Grief Relief podcast. Welcome, Laura Medio. Did I say that right? Yes, you got it. First try. Yes. Yeah, right, thank, well, thank you so you, much. Yeah, thank you for joining us or joining us me um all the way from boston massachusetts how is it over there it's good it's um it's like a balmy maybe 45 out so i'm gonna call it warm i'm in a t-shirt oh oh okay it, fine so, it, and hang on it, we it's have a to big really 45 degrees fahrenheit what's that in celsius i don't know i'm the wrong Hold person on. Yes. hey siri what's 45 degrees fahrenheit in celsius 7 degrees Celsius. You're saying that's a balmy warm morning in Boston. It's not warm, but from what we've had over the last couple of months, it's it's a huge improvement. It All really right, is. I'll, I'll um I'll believe you. I think it's about about 90 degrees then Fahrenheit in Dubai at the moment. So we Oh wow. We're slightly I can use different. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I've actually moved my curtains because I realized the last time I did an episode in Zoom, I looked like I was in some kind of weird cave that I'd been locked away in. So I've left <laughs> the door open and uh, here we go. Um, Laura, thank you so much, as I keep saying, for joining me because it is nine o'clock in the morning where you are. And I want to talk all about your amazing dad, John the story surrounding it and then why you then move forward with the brilliant Instagram account that is grief hungry. Sure. Um, so yeah, I lost my dad in August of 2018, um, to a very bizarre accident. I, ca- I hate using the term freak. Um, okay. cause the news used that a lot and it just, I don't know, it bothered me. It still does to this day. Um, He was driving to work and a crowbar either kicked up off the road or came off of a truck um, and came through his windshield and killed him on impact. Um, So the sort of facts of that like are still unknown to us. Um, And you know, the whole like science of trying to think like, how does that happen? That, you know, how does it hit that one spot? How does it hit just him is um, still something that kind of plagues us. But yeah, so we unfortunately uh, lost our dad um, very suddenly and at a really bad time, we were less than a month from, so I'm just one of two girls. Uh, My parents are married. And I have one older sister um, who was getting married less than a month later. Oh, um, no. So it was just a serious whirlwind for our family um, and a huge loss. So I, I probably should have kicked off by saying, you know, my dad was just like, he was small in stature. Like he was like five, six and had a beer belly, but he was, you know, a very loud um, prominent attorney in our area. Um, so he was small in stature, but had like a big presence, as I was saying, and, you know, everyone loved him. My, you know, friends from home, friends from college. Um, he had more friends than anyone I know. Um, and he was big in the law community and, Mm. and in our, um, you know, town and neighborhood in general. So it was a huge loss. Um, And so pretty soon after the loss and the, the, so we went through with the wedding and um, we were quite busy. So that's something I always try to bring up is like the grief was unique because of how busy we were. So we had the wedding to be thinking about, but because he was an attorney an acting attorney, he had like active cases going on. So so much of the time spent uh, immediately after grieving was doing actual work. Like a lot of people don't realize that don't 
handle a loss or haven't handled a loss themselves is like, there's so much work to be done mm. afterward, whether someone's like wrapping up an estate or whatever it is. Um, my sister and I were so busy with helping my mom, you know, tidy up all of his open cases and close out his office and, oh, wow. you know, pay people back that had like, con- uh, retainers open with him and, and active cases and, um, super overwhelming. And, you know, as you probably know, like dealing with insurance, car insurance, um, the situation for us at hand also was just ugly because it was all over the news, um, for a long time. So that piece was overwhelming. So when that settled a little bit, um, I started, really grieving, I guess you could say. I didn't actually start grieving until like a few months later. Of course, I was still in shock. Um, But that's where I started finding such a strong grief community was on Instagram. Um, I just kind of did the research on my own. I was just searching the hashtag grief. And I started seeing these accounts that I resonated so much with. Um, I started seeing these quotes and words that, you know, sometimes, which you might feel too, like sometimes I was seeing things that were just so generic and didn't align with how I felt at all. Mm. And, um, and sometimes I felt like some, some of them were just like aesthetically pleasing to put on Instagram when, but then I would see ones that were very hard hitting, blunt truth to grief and loss. And I would start sharing them. And I was really blunt and honest like very early on with posting and not for any reason but my own and that's Mm. just the way I was coping even before I lost my dad I was I would post him on social media all the time I would post funny pictures videos I would FaceTime him in the middle of a bar like that was just kind of (laughs) the way our relationship was I was very close with him so all of a sudden feeling like I couldn't do that anymore or that that was awkward for someone um, just wasn't sitting well with me. And I just decided I would continue to um, post about him, but really grief hungry. I I found an old note in my iPhone last night from November of 2018. So I lost my dad in August in November and I write myself notes a lot in my phone. But in November of that year, so just a couple of months after I lost him, I wrote a note like, I need to start a food account where I post, you know, recipes that are for bad days, lots of chopping, lots of attention to detail. And then I also need to post recipes for good days. So like easy, um, you know, low energy, whatever. And you know, I've always been a really strong cook and like loved food. And if you were to look at my old, like personal account posts, I've been posting food since I first got an Instagram when I was probably like a senior in high school or a freshman in college. Um, And for years and years and years, friends have said like, you should start a food blog. And I just, I never wanted to just be another page and Mm, mm. I I didn't, I maybe didn't feel like I had a niche. Um, But once I lost my dad and realized how much grief impacts you in so many different like complex ways and realizing one of them was cooking and eating and your appetite, thinking about someone like my mom, who's a new widow having to cook for just herself now and, Mm -hmm. and you know, dig up the energy to do that or to be in a grocery store and walk by Twizzlers, which were like one of my dad's favorite candy, things as simple as that. People just don't think of. So that was a long-winded answer, but um, that's kind of how Grief Hungry came about. I just, I started doing more research and I realized I do have a niche here and what I'm posting on my personal page is resonating with a lot of people. So all the the cooking, all of the bluntness. Um, So I just went ahead and my dad's birthday this past year in July, 
I posted his, um, his meatball recipe, which he was famous for. Um, it's even on his obituary. We talked about how one of his favorite things was to, you know, host parties and host family and, um, make his famous meatball. So I shared that with the world and, um, it's just kind of carried on from there. Uh, honestly, I, I love it so much. Um, and I love the fact that then it's it's opened up to other people wanting to connect with you and send in photos of their loved ones and their favorites. And right. some of them as well, as I, as I mentioned to my brother in episode two, when I first spoke about you, I was like what, drooling thinking about some of these recipes. Um, your surname then, and with the connection with meatballs, is it Italian heritage you are in your family? Yes, mostly Italian. My mom is some Irish as well, but okay. you know, I visibly look very Italian. I look just like my dad, you know, Mediterranean skin, prefer um, Italian food and whatnot. Yep. So it's very close ties for us. Certainly. Yeah, I was going to say. And then how after, you know, your dad passed away, um, that impacted you obviously as a family unit, but how was then dinner times? Were you all living together? You obviously, I know there's college and whatnot. I don't know how old you and your sister are, but how was then dinner impacted? Because it's clearly a big thing in your household. Sure. So I live in Boston, which is like an hour from home. So luckily I was not far. And my sister lives only about 15 minutes away from my mom. Oh, nice. um, so she's married now she's married at the time was right. engaged to be married. Yeah. Um, she's two years older than me. So she's 32 and I turned 30 in a couple of months. Um, so my parents were living just the two of them with our dog at home at the time of the accident. Mm. Um, so I came home. It's hard to even like think back to that time because you mm, mm. kind of block it out. I um I came home and my mom and I and my sister were mostly together. Like I'd say we had a big family home still that my parents were living in. So there's plenty of place to like sleep and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um so I kind of left my apartment in Boston for a couple of weeks and lived at home. I don't even remember eating, to be honest. How weird. Uh, like I've definitely written or talked about um, how there's just this like patrol of food, as you might also resonate with, of people, you know, that's the first thing people think about, especially Italians, is bringing over uh, meals, bringing mm. over lasagna and whatever. Um, and it gets kind of old, you know, you get edible arrangements and people mean so well. Um, but it's something I thought a whole lot about when I was launching Grief Hungry it was those things stop coming, those meals stop coming, the check-ins stop coming. And then all of a sudden, like, you still have to eat, you still have to cook for yourself. And, you know, not that my mom is lucky per se, but I could imagine how much of a burden or a stress grieving the loss of a husband or a significant other is when you have young kids you have no yeah. option but to get up get them ready for school feed them breakfast lunch and dinner pack lunches whatever not that my mom had it any easier like I said but I could see that just being just such an overwhelming challenge for yeah. a young mom to deal with so um Soon after that, I did make it back to Boston and it was actually my boyfriend who I live with now that encouraged a lot of the cooking at home. So, I mean, prior to losing my dad, he, like I said, a huge cook, um, always quite a foodie, uh, you know, would always research restaurants for 72 hours before I went to them. Um, <laughs> And I knew exactly Are what you I wanted. Are you a menu checker? You're a menu checker. Oh, I'm not only a menu checker. I go to the restaurant location on Instagram and see any tagged photos from the restaurant to see 
if I can actually see with the dish or whatever it looks like. Yeah, I am. Wow. I am. Okay. Cause I, yeah. I'm, I'm not I, my, I've got a couple of friends who are menu pickers in advance. Sometimes I'll see, I'll go on Instagram. Yeah. And see the tag photos usually because I want to see like, are we going to sit inside? Are we sitting outside? Yeah. What's am, the vibe? Am I wearing jeans? Cause all I want to wear is jeans. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. So you really do go to the nth degree. I don't necessarily know at 100% certainty what I'm going to order. Yeah. But I like to have an idea, I think mainly because I just, I want the best of the best. I mm -hmm. want, you know, what people would consider like, oh, you have to get this at XYZ restaurant. So that's kind yeah. of always been my mindset. But um, yeah, I, I just started, obviously I was having an especially hard time early on in my grief. And I found that doing a lot of chopping, um, you know, using a big knife and chopping up like a shit ton of carrots, onions, whatever, that alleviated a lot of stress for me. That was super therapeutic. Really? Um, yeah. And was your boyfriend I, terrified? Is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he was. I I have a little bit of the stronger knife skills in the family in general, so I've just given that task. You know, even thinking back to when my dad was around, I, you know, for holidays, I can just picture him and I like sitting at, at the counter for Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. He would peel the potatoes. I would chop them. Okay. I, I, I just, I liked that job. Yeah. Um, but I started looking up uh, just out of curiosity prior to ever launching Grief Hungry. I was doing some research and I was looking up like grief, cooking grief therapy. And there's so many articles out there. There was an article in, I think it was the New York times that talked about this one woman in particular who offers classes to new widows for like cooking for one and sort of like generating that new interest and like passion for cooking again and learning, um, how to make meals in advance and, you know, meal prep so that you have stuff in the freezer for those mm, days where, mm. you know, you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to have to do anything, but instead of ordering takeout or instead of just eating chocolate and a glass of wine, which is fine here and there, um, you'll have meals, you know, in mm. the freezer that mm. you can just grab and go. Um, because yeah, so, that's something you don't think about. You literally don't think about it. So your parents were together for how long? Uh, like almost 30 years. Yeah. So your mom has been cooking for at least two, if not three or four people. And now she's cooking for one. I, I'd never, that's some, again, something I'd never even thought right. about. Right. Wow. And I, she's not a complainer at, at all, has such a good attitude and is just, the most giving, thoughtful person. But there are still days, like just last night, Dylan and I made a salad and I was FaceTiming her and she said, oh, I had, I had chips and hummus for dinner. And it's, I know she's not saying it from a place of like sadness or concern, no. but I think that's a, that's a common trend. I think, unfortunately, I've heard from a lot of followers of mine I've even heard from one that says like their mom has certainly developed, um, you know, an eating disorder because mm. she's just not, she's not feeding herself. She's mm. not nurturing herself. Um, of course there's parallels with, you know, mental health issues and that, um, but the eating is severely impacted. The, the passion for eating, you know, so much of eating and cooking is like for someone so yeah. when you've lost someone especially as as a widow or widower um you've kind of lost the like energy and excitement to do that yeah and uh, yeah food is absolutely fascinating and I am I, it's really funny you the way you described your dad is very similar to my dad when you were saying small in sort of size but large <laughs> in sort of personality and whatnot did you ever used to um, was your dad your go-to if you were stuck cooking something and you didn't know what to do um, and you the cooking advice? Depending on, my dad was my go-to for everything. Like if I got a flat tire, if I 
you know, had an issue with a friend, I, I spoke to him. Okay. Um, as far as the cooking, baking specific questions goes, I think I'd more likely call my mom Still your mom. for that. Yeah. 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 I they legitimately... both were... No, go, go on, ahead. carry on, carry on. I was just going to say they're both good cooks in their own right. I think my mom's more of a baker. So mm. she, she would have the more uh, specific answers around like, what temperature, what type of baking dish should I use? Those are more so the types of questions I would have because yeah. I'm more of like a, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't really, it's funny that I fall, that I run an account where I post recipes because the reality is like, I don't really measure. I have a very hard time. How do you do things. it? I don't understand. Just, My mom was the same. I, it's so funny. I had to do this recently. Like, um, I needed to get into uh, American Airlines. I was like looking up flights and one of the questions I had to answer was like, what was your favorite, you know, uh, TV show as a kid? And I couldn't figure it out. And the guy on the phone was like, um, it's a cooking show. Oh, no. So like, that was me as a kid. I, I Brilliant. was coming home from school and watching like Emeril Lagasse and I was watching the Food Network and I was making like, shrimp scampi in like seventh grade no after way. school oh yeah I mean granted I was like a much heavier middle schooler and I probably right. should have like cooled it on making shrimp scampi um but I loved to cook I thought for a long time I was going to go to culinary school and um and do that so I I don't know I just early on unless I was baking where I needed like the sciencey very specific measurements mm, and mm. um you know you can't deviate uh I was just going with the flow I just I that I'm not a, a cooker I'm I'm really bad I'm very much a can't cook won't cook kind of affair and cooking for one is just awful so it's so much easier to just get delivery but um both my mom there's nothing and, wrong with that yeah exactly uh both my mom and my stepmom were exactly like that they I you know I remember when I moved out and I would call my mom and say well how much how much salt do I need and she'd go I don't really know like this much you know it, yeah. that doesn't help me but with, if I follow a recipe I'm kind of okay it doesn't mean I do it but yeah I kind of follow a recipe I don't think there's a gray area with that I have found with like my followers or friends that ask if I make something and post it there's either the folks that make it and they'll let me know like oh I swapped this and I swapped right. this and I did chili flakes instead or I have a friend that's like are you sure you baked it for 13 minutes because mine was a little overdone and I'm like you know what it was probably an estimate so uh, give me a break <laughs> um you mentioned your followers there for grief hungry what I love about your account is that it it automatically became a community. And that's what mm -hmm. I've seen straight away. Now I joined you, joined you. I became a follower and a fan in October around about the time when I was thinking of launching the podcast anyway. Um, sure. But I love the fact that whether you'll post about your dad, John, or, or anything else, or be it about you, or whether you're posting something that a follower has sent in from one of their loved ones, the comment section is just this, this hive of of support and 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 sharing memories and it's it, sometimes it's, it's I'm sure you feel it and that's why I wanted to ask you it's quite tough to read now how does that bear on you do you feel that maybe sometimes you've taken on too much and it's maybe a bit m mentally overwhelming do you get a lot of dms that you feel you have to reply to or yeah no I'm I'm glad you asked and I appreciate you saying that so much about the community because I feel that way too I'm always mm. blown away um I'm not just getting likes and you know mm. little emojis on the comments which I'll take that fine I'll take anything but I'm getting comments of, from you know just this past weekend someone commented and said like you've made me feel less alone in my thoughts and mm. I don't go into it with any intention other than to just share my honest, brutal truth about my own experience and be open to others. But getting something like that mm. um, just makes it more real. And like you said, 
it doesn't make it overwhelming or a burden to be that person, but it does mean that I now have to show up. Um, so if there's any space, like if there's any way that I feel obligated, I, don't, I can't think of a better word to do anything, it's I need to make sure I at least provide one recipe a week. So mm -hmm. if I don't get one from a follower, which is really my preference. So at the beginning of Grief Hungry, I had like a big long laundry list of like recipes and submissions already kind of like built out so I could schedule those out, whatever. And if I don't have one of those, I will provide one from myself that I've, that I've written and that I've worked on, which doesn't seem like all that much of a lift, but sometimes depending on how I'm feeling, what I'm writing, um, I, I say to my friends or family sometimes when it's a Sunday and I need to submit that is it takes a lot out of me. It's very hard to explain, but I'll write something like very brutal and honest, or I'll share something that's been in my iPhone notes. Like I talked about for two years, something I wasn't sure about sharing with the world and then I'll get it out there. And it's constant notifications and messages and DMS and comments. And, um, I couldn't ask for anything more. I'm glad that it's resonated with people so much, but I, I do feel a moral obligation to answer everyone individually um, mm -hmm. and make a point to make them feel not alone in their own grief. And I'd say the only times I, I feel like it's a little too much, I just have to defer people to speaking to a professional because- you know, there've been multiple times on the page, either with messages or with um, questions, if I do like a Q and A or, or um, you know, open up the floor for people to put in a submission or something. I, I've had to just defer um, to a professional because it's just not my place to, mm, to mm. speak on that. I'm not um, a therapist. Um, I can't give that type of advice. I can't give mental health advice. Um, so that part's hard because I know what it's like to be in that dark place and I know how it feels to be struggling in that way. And I, I think it's important to shine a light on mental health issues mm -hmm. and make it a point to make it clear that grief has these serious implications on people's minds and bodies mm -hmm. and emotions. Um, but I just have to try to guide those individuals. Um, I've gone as far as asking, you know, where they're from and like looking up, you know, a couple therapists or someone that oh, they can really? speak to. Mm. Um, and that's about as far as I'll go because I don't know um, another path to take. That's yeah, of course. stepping. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, um, and I'm sure with the community and with the followers that you have, if you didn't post a recipe for a week, I'm sure they wouldn't hate you for it. But as you say, you feel this oh, of kind of not. sense of responsibility. And I think probably actually even on the other side that they may even be worried about where you are, maybe be yeah. physically or mentally. Um, you did, talking about your, your mental state um, with regards to grief, you posted just recently about the memory loss that you suffered temporarily but then has uh, you know you've had kind of peaks and troughs with it since your dad died can you tell me a bit more about that yeah um that was something not that you can prepare yourself at all for how a loss will impact you but that was not what I was expecting um I and there was a lot that happened that I wasn't expecting mm. um but I, um, I really early on started realizing that it was making me even more forgetful and sort of like absent-minded, especially with like short-term things. So like misplacing my phone, um, forgetting my laptop, um, for work or, you know, forgetting a meeting was at a certain time or. You said whatnot. even more. So you, 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 what, you were already a pretty sort of scatty or forgetful person anyway or yeah my college roommate would always say like I was the most put together person but like when it came to 
the moments that I could unwind. So like I played sports in college and I was a very good student. So I had my shit together there. But when it came to like my dorm room, a mess, <laughs> totally disorganized. When it came to, you know, my roommates and I trying to get out of the apartment, which I wrote on the post, um, I was the one that couldn't find my wallet, couldn't find my debit card, couldn't find my phone. I just was, as you said, probably scatterbrained, but also just like thinking about 10,000 things instead of mm. what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. Um, so when it came to grieving, I took a couple of weeks off of work. I had a really good experience at the time with my employer and their bereavement leave policies. Um, and when I got back to work, I kind of could only focus on work. I realized like, this is a responsibility that I have. This is a paying job. And like from nine to five, I could be paying attention, um, dedicated to work. But outside of that, I would sort of like veer off. I, you know, would misplace things or forget about things. And I more recently, with that submission that I wrote, I, I kind of had an experience recently with two really good friends where I was having dinner with them and multiple things got brought up where I said like, did I know that? Did you tell me that? And they're like, yeah, you definitely knew that. And I just started realizing like, I'm still two and a half years later, I'm still distracted, absent-minded mm -hmm. um, and it's still, impacting me in ways that I didn't realize it would um and across the board like through without the community throughout the community I'm getting feedback that so many people felt this same way and it, it, it takes a very quick google search just to see that like brain fog and mm. concentration is obviously um impacted with grief but my family in particular both my sister and mom have said that they've like really experienced forgetfulness and have like grief brain. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's something people that aren't grieving certainly need to have a strong level of patience for yeah. dealing with. Um, but it's, it's a challenge and it's not, like I said, it's just not something I would have expected would impact me. No. And I, uh, I, didn't suffer with anything like that. Yes, the kind of grief fog, there were the blurry days. I um, I know so many more details surrounding my dad's passing than my mum's passing. And there's so many other things regarding that. But again, going back to your Instagram at Grief Hungry, when you posted about that was, again, the comments of people saying, thank God you said that. Like, I thought I was on my own. I thought I was going crazy because I was forgetting everything. And I've tried to explain to my husband or my mom or my dad that these, this is the reason I'm forgetting. So, right. and, and I think again, going back to, and, and by no way am I saying that's the reason I started the podcast because that wasn't how it was supposed to start out, but was that people reaching out to me as well saying, oh, I never realized this. and I never realized that. Mm -hmm. And I listened to this episode and, oh, that's how I felt. And that that kind of thing which then goes back to everyone grieves in in so many different ways um right. i know it's um going to be a tough subject for you so feel free to not not talk about it but you mentioned about obviously in the the most bizarre circumstances in which your your dad died but you mentioned about the media now you are the first person that i've spoken to that would have had that and of course it being so recent with social media and it, it just must have been incessant as you said how i can't even begin to understand how you and maybe even more so perhaps your mum being of an older generation how did you guys handle that at what point did you just go shut up yeah it was it was really challenging. And I, I have said, you know, many times that the fact that my dad's loss was so widely publicized doesn't make it bigger or more important than someone else's loss, mm. but it makes it vastly different because we just could not escape it. It went as far as being on like NBC, ABC nightly news is like national Facebook yeah. page. Yeah. Um, and I've shared some of this on Grief Hungry before, or I've talked about it, which is 
you realize in those moments that you are siloed in this community of people who have lost someone. And then there are, there are people who haven't. Mm -hmm. And the people who haven't are the ones commenting horribly nasty things on these social media accounts and news reports. So it was a challenge certainly to see some of those comments and and posts i remember what on earth are they comment i don't understand what on earth are they commenting so because he was an attorney people oh. were commenting um you know sounds like bad karma um sounds like he was on the wrong side of the law oh my um, god i remember you know, based on the time and, and uh, the politics occurring at the time, people were writing, um, must have been a Hillary supporter or- Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Just like the most ridiculous barbaric things. And I had to take the approach. Um, I wanted to badly, but I had to take the approach to not respond, not mm. comment on it. Mm. I knew that it would only get uglier from there. And I had friends and family telling us like, not like, don't read it. I was going to say, media, who was the person that really stopped you from doing that? Was that, or was it you? Um, I had multiple people in my inner circle just Good. being like, please stop looking at that stuff. Um, because it really was everywhere. It was like hundreds of, you know, if you search my dad's name, it's so many articles like on very like large scale newspapers in the Boston area, but also like all over Twitter. And like I said, on Facebook. Um, so that was frustrating. But the other piece that many people don't know is, um, you know, the, the way in which I found out about my dad's accident was also kind of worst case scenario. I was having my phone I had a very weird and I never believed in like signs or symbols or anything like that before but I had a really weird situation that morning my kitchen cabinet collapsed just collapsed when I went to get a coffee mug okay. and I still get like goosebumps thinking about it because it it collapsed very similar time to where like you know 50 miles, however many miles away my dad was, was getting in this accident. Um, so the cabinet fell on my cell phone. So my cell phone was like shattered and I couldn't get in touch with anyone, but I, I went to a local coffee shop and brought my laptop and just went on Facebook and like messaged my sister and my mom and just said like, Hey, just FYI, my dad didn't have social media. He he couldn't even, he could barely send an email on his phone. He was not tech savvy. Um, I just said like, hey, if you guys are trying to reach me for any reason, I, my phone's broken, you can message me on Facebook. And I said the same thing to my boyfriend. So then I went to Verizon, just like a cell phone provider here and um, was getting my phone fixed. And when I came out of Verizon, I was having, a, I was getting a cell phone call from my cousin, which was a little odd. Um, and I answered and she was so frantic and like, she was like, have you talked to your mom? Like your dad got in a car accident. So I just hung up on her, called my mom. And I just like found out then and there, like he was in an accident, but we didn't know any details, but I knew I was an hour away and I knew already that he had died, mm -hmm. um, which was horrible. And I knew that my mom had a really hard time telling me that on the phone. And she was saying, um, you know, the state police are sending a car to you. They're going to drive you here to the hospital. But luckily I had a friend who was not working that day and she was able to drive me instead. But my point of all of this is even still sitting in the emergency room with a lot of friends and family, knowing that he was in just the other room had already passed. We didn't know the circumstances of the accident. Really? We knew that he had died in a car accident, yeah. but I was just sitting there like, oh, he must. So my dad had a heart attack when he was like 39, almost 40, which was really young. And we were super young at the time. So I just kind of always assumed my whole life. Um, and I'm sorry if this is hitting a soft spot with you, but I, 
I just assumed my dad would have another heart attack later on okay. in life. And like that would be it. That was my assumption. Like that was how I would lose my dad. You can't predict how you would ever lose someone, but I never f- thought I would lose him the way I did. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in the emergency room with my boyfriend and friends and family and everyone's still like, you know, did he have a stroke while he was driving? Did he hit something? You know, this is all so strange. You just knew it was in a, a, a car accident and no one had yeah. told you anything else. A news report came out before we were even notified. A news report came out on our phone what the cause of the accident was. That it was road debris, that it was a crowbar. Reported by a local news station before our own family who was 20 feet away from him knew what the cause of the accident was yeah so it had somehow it had somehow gotten leaked from the police to the news report and you know my my sister's in-laws I had their words with um not the parents but a few people had their words with the news station and the newspaper just saying like that was handled very horribly Mm. so um that goes back to the whole talk of the media though, is that we were frustrated with the media immediately. Then we get to our home that evening, news reporters all over our house, knocking, ringing our doorbell for us to speak less than 24 hours after the loss. Messaging us on Facebook, finding our personal Facebook pages and messaging us asking if we're willing to speak and willing to say a few words. None of us wanted to give any type of like live response or interview, but it was just like such an overwhelming amount of requests that we felt like as a family, we needed to put out just like a written statement. Yeah. So we provided that via Facebook. Um, But it, it gave me such a different perspective on how the media portrays loss and, and news. Um, and how, you know, they just, I, they mean well, but they prioritize getting the story and being the first to get the story. And they want to get, you know, the heartfelt feelings from the family. And they probably want, you know, my mom and us, and they want tears and they want, you know, yeah. viewers. And it was really frustrating because, you know, there are human beings behind these losses. And it's something I, as you've probably seen, I share constantly now with the amount of grief and loss the world has been experiencing. It is so frustrating to see the media just handle these reports, you know, in Boston in particular, they'll say like, oh, we're, we're down in COVID numbers. We only had 1700 deaths this week. It's like, wait a second. Imagine being, imagine being one of those families. Mm. Imagine being the like millions of people that have lost someone over the last year. It's, it's kind of barbaric. It is. I've used that word a lot, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. They have, I mean, they have no shame, do they? Uh, Whatsoever. And you know that, you know, on one side, you understand that they have a job to do. I mean, why they would go into that line of work I I don't know but um yeah it's pretty full-on wow well thank you so much for sharing that because that that must have been really tough from from beginning to end did um what did then anything come up in the media you know a year after his death on an anniversary or anything did uh, was anything was there ever any sorry I found like a million questions of Tasasha at the same time was there any um what's the word I'm thinking of um like, like proof an, or result. Yeah, like an investigation. What's the word I'm thinking of? There's sort of not been one, but um, as a family, we are like still curious and cool. looking into it. Um, my mom actually saw a medium soon after my dad passed. And okay. we're not a big spiritual uh, family in that sense or like I said prior I I never really would have thought that I could be connected to someone by signs or symbols Mm. or whatever but then you lose someone and you realize like those make you feel really good and sometimes that's all you're looking for so long story short she did 
see a medium where my dad came through and you know the impact that that experience had was like shocking to my sister and I it was very really very uniquely um my dad like it was just the things that were said and the things that were shared there's just no granted even if someone looked him up like there's a million things you could find but the things that this medium was sharing were just like absolutely never in a million years could anyone have researched very tight to our family or to my dad and um through that he came through and made a point to try to stress to my mom like this will be a hard fought challenge but I would like you to look more into this. I would like you to like, look more into, um, you know, if there's like a culprit to this or like mm. how this really happened. And I think that's something that has plagued her, especially maybe since experiencing that or since talking with a lot of other like lawyers and, and um, uh, police and whatnot since the experience is that they, because he was, involved in such a tight-knit community like they felt like obligated to they owed it to him to try to okay. figure it out too yeah so um in a roundabout way still trying to figure it out but it's very 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 hard to try to pinpoint um couldn't imagine um yeah th- I wanted to ask two questions from what you said there the first one being did your mum find comfort in the fact that this medium you know that she thought that she was connected to your dad and then off the back of that with obviously now that your dad seemingly or or had come through and said look into it a little bit more do you think that that's a good thing so it's kind of like I don't want to belittle your mum but it's keeping her busy and it's keeping her focused and it's still for your dad no, I know what you're saying. And I would you ever worry that she should do you ever just think, okay, mom, like time to relax. We're never going to find out. I don't think it overwhelms her thoughts and days so much that it's a problem. Okay. If if it did, we would have already had that conversation. Hmm. Um, I think it's, it's just, you know, the way in which things happen are just maddening. And I, I don't think that she or even my sister and I could get past, you know, I remember one of the first things my sister said after we lost him was he would be so pissed off that this is how it happened. He would oh. just be so pissed off. I can imagine. Like, I can just, I could just picture him being like, are you, are you kidding me? Like I, I take the tiniest bit of comfort. Like if I could change things, I would in a heartbeat if there was any way to change things. But I do take the tiniest bit of comfort that he did not, struggle and that he died on impact and he he didn't hurt or Mm. and he didn't harm anyone else and Mm -mm. so I take that but getting back to your comment uh and question about the medium is my family all three of us super skeptical yeah um and my mom had just done her research about like a local medium that had like I think like a year long wait list. So she really never saw it happening. And then one day I got a call and they just happened to have an opening and she went and I was really skeptical hearing from her afterward, Mm. but she had her cute little notepad and all of these things. And she was very excited to tell the two of us. And it was just, it was so clear that what she was sharing with us was not something that this medium felt like let me fill this woman up with some bullshit to make her feel better. Yeah. Yeah. That is not, that was not my mom's experience in the slightest. It was true and honest, sometimes honest, like to a fault, blunt about things about what was happening within the three of us and what was happening with my dad and ways in which he came through. And one thing I remember the medium shared with my mom was that it was like kind of rare for someone to have such strong of a um, presence as a spirit that early on. I, these are things I didn't know, but okay. apparently sometimes it takes some time for a spirit to come through, but we had already be, been seeing signs of my dad in weird instances, like weeks after, um, which we're very lucky that we had, because I know a lot of people just like 
if they believe in these types of things, they struggle and they wish so bad for any yeah. type of touch point. And, and we got a few very early on, which made us feel better. I, I mm. don't know another way to put it. Mm. Um, but my mom's experience was so strong that it's even made me slightly interested in maybe going to see one myself. I was going yeah, um, to ask if that had, that had moved you in that way, because it is true, isn't it? If you are skeptical and then all of a sudden something happens, mine was a dream about my friend who, who took her own life. And I had a dream where she spoke to me and I remember waking up just sort of going, okay, I feel a little bit kind of more at peace with her decision as it were as if she was telling me because I was so angry with her kind of you know and right before I'd be like what a load of old crap mm -hmm. you know and now but you haven't you have you is it courage that you're plucking up to go and see this lady or is it the way the year waiting list I think it's courage but I also think it's you know there's a longer time now sort of between sort of any type of sign or symbol I'm seeing from my dad. And okay. I think, I think admittedly it's me just like aching for some type of feeling or yeah. connection. And if I'm not getting that, I'm not much of a dreamer. So I, I, I unfortunately haven't like, it's not that I haven't dreamt of him. I haven't dreamt of anything that I can remember in a long time. Um, or I haven't seen or experienced some type of symbol. So it's made me more so just like crave that mm. sort of touch point. Um, and knowing that my mom has strong experience doesn't necessarily make me want to go to the same medium, but it has made me want to, you know, maybe explore that um, yeah. one day myself. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think whatever helps you the royal you anyone who's grieving whatever helps you and if it doesn't harm anyone else and just let people do what they've got to do right um, and it could be mumbo jumbo but if it gives you a, a sense of peace and whatever then happy days yeah laura as you know because this is how i found you i ask all of my guests for a recommended instagram account um or sure. a podcast that that they that they love and i love at grief hungry but um do you have one that is a go-to for you that is either perhaps within the community or something that you just like every day yeah so i i thought long and hard about this and i decided what makes the most sense was probably sharing one that it didn't have an impact on me to become a content producer in the grief mm -hmm. community, but it has since the day I lost my dad till now has one of the most like impactful experiences. And that's um, the account it's on Instagram is called grief to glorious unfolding. Grief it's to glorious unfolding. grief to glorious unfolding and it's a woman um janine who lost her son and it is just like the most beautiful it's strictly words um and sometimes in short verse she writes all of it herself but it's the most painful yet like beautiful relatable words I've ever seen I don't think there's an account that I share more often with others or with on my story mm. whether it's grief hungry or my personal account like you know you may just be scrolling along and you see something she has written and I don't know her I've never really spoken to her even as part of the grief community as you could call it now um it hits you right in the gut and she is speaking right to you and to your grief and you know you think you've had a unique thought in your grieving experience and you go to her page you have not you're not alone in yeah. the things that she has to say yeah. um, and some of it's really empowering too and you know motivating to incorporate your person in your present day and in your future which she talks a lot about with her son um so it's, it's really beautiful, but I think that's the one that, that hits home for me the most. Um, mm. Oh, for sure. nice. Okay. So grief to glorious unfollowing. Unfolding. 
unfolding. That's why yeah. I've written I've written like a doctor's prescription down here. Grief <laughs> it's to, a long grief, one. Grief, grief to glorious, to glorious unfolding. unfolding. Okay, amazing. And that and it, and it helped you. Oh, absolutely. I think it it still to this day helps mm. me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think there'll ever come a time when you'll step away from grief hungry? I don't think so. I think, like you said before, you know, has there ever been a time where you you don't have it in you to produce something that has happened. And I just take the approach of sharing a different recipe or a different Mm -hmm. like blogger or chef that, you know, you can find a recipe on, on their page. Um, But no, I'm super motivated by grief hungry and, and continuing to produce this type of content. I long-term really hope to have a cookbook or an ebook that people can Mm. can download i i think as we talked about prior it's very nice to get chocolate covered strawberries and lasagna when those stop coming i think it'd be even nicer to send someone you know here's a book written by the people that get you and here's what they did to get by um or here's what they ate and um because nothing resonates more with me than people who get it. And mm. I may be a little biased by that, but I, I really prefer to have these types of conversations with the people that understand where I'm coming from. Mm. And then in turn, I think it's a very important piece to continue to educate people that haven't experienced grief and loss yet. That's a huge part of my mission and the page is because we're all inevitably going to experience grief and loss may not unfortunately be to the extreme of losing both parents like you did or losing someone so suddenly and like horrifically like I did but it's bound to happen and you're you're better off being prepared in how to Mm. speak to others and deal with it um than you are without I love it Laura, thank you so much for everything. Thank I you. know that we've we've had a, a few Instagram DMs backwards and forwards, and it's it's so nice to actually finally speak to you and hear the full story of your dad, John, and what was your mum's name? Sue. Sue, John and Sue. They yeah. sound like really English names, by the way. That's not an American <laughs> mum and dad's name. Um, Laura, all the way from Dubai and UAE to Boston, Massachusetts, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Speak to you soon. Bye.